Welcome back. It's Swing Pass Week 2 Preview Pod coming at you. We've got a full slate in the second weekend of the 2023 season, and we're here to highlight some of our favorite matchups. We're going to get started in chronological order, starting off with a big South Division matchup tomorrow night on Friday as Carolina Flyers who lost last weekend against D.C. at home, will travel to face the 1-0 Atlanta Hustle. Hustle looking like a completely revamped team this year after missing the playoffs last year. They had the highest offense efficiency after week one. Daniel, what do you like about Atlanta going into this matchup against their South Division rivals? Well, what's not to like about Atlanta at this point? I mean, they they just made a statement in week one, right? Like they they clicked offensively, defensively. Everyone was was throwing the disc super well. They were making great decisions. Seven turnovers as a team, like that number right there. That is only a number that like the very very elite teams in this league are able to get to in a single game. And Carolina used to be right around that margin for the bulk of the last two seasons, but I'm worried about them. I I am worried about them early this season in particular. They don't have their full roster. They looked a little bit lost with the rotations against DC. So it's weird because Carolina did beat Atlanta in all three meetings they had last season, but Atlanta feels like the favorite heading into this weekend, right? I'll add even a little bit more shading that complicates things in both directions. Atlanta has failed to score 20 goals in the last four matchups against the Flyers, dating back to even 2021. But I I totally agree with you. I think with the Flyers' absences this weekend, particularly, again, with Matt Gucci-Johannes, Eric Taylor, Joe White won't be available in this game, Mm -hmm. there's just going to be a dearth of throwing talent for this Flyers team that we've grown so accustomed to being at an excellent level of offensive efficiency. And and then on the flip side, you have this hustle team that was the best uh, deep throwing team in 2022. They connected on the highest percentage of their huck looks. But then in week one, they kind of come out with this just full force um, spread attack, I want to call it. Because what they had yeah. five throwers finished with 28 or more completions uh, Austin Taylor, Bobby Lay, Christian Olsen, the rookie Liam Haberfield, who looked so good in his debut, and then Max mm-hmm. Thorne last weekend. And I think among those five, there was maybe five throwaways, and they had something like 300-odd yeah. yeah. completions combined. I mean, the the precision and and the, the tempo of this 2023 Atlanta offense, it should put everyone in the South Division and really the league at large on watch. For sure. Uh, also, Brett Holzmeier playing both ways, played 11 O points, 11 D points. I think they're they're ready to unleash Brett Holzmeier. He played a bunch of offense in college for Auburn the past couple of years. I know he like has always had that offensive ability and has flashed it at times on the counterattack in the ADL, but I think we've largely just thought of him as like this towering big defender. And obviously he had that all ADL or all defense season in 2021 where I think he was also like a runner-up for defensive player of the year potentially he he has a lot of of appealing all-around ability and he had six blocks against Indy last week it's interesting I was looking at his stats from the past games against Carolina he only had two blocks against them in two games last year but in 2021 you'll remember they started the season he had a huge game I think he had three blocks in that first meeting or maybe four blocks and then three blocks in their second meeting. So he had seven blocks against block. Carolina. I want to right, say he had right, in OT. Block in that week one win in 2021, the, the big upset at home that kind of announced the hustle being a true contender that year. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for his potential. Just the fact that he was racking up blocks at such a, a high rate against Indy. And granted, they were they were testing him deep maybe a little bit more than they should have. I don't expect Carolina to quite be that loose with their deep look attempts. Um, but yeah, I'm just excited for for his ceiling and then the ceiling of the, the team as a whole. Yeah, I really think Atlanta reestablished themselves in kind of that championship tier with just how good they looked in week one. I know we're so prone to overreacting after one data point from the season. <laughs> Who can blame but, us? You know, I, I, 
Atlanta, by almost any metric on a team stat category last year, rated out as like a top eight, if not top seven team. I mean, yeah. they were efficient in all the ways you'd want to see. They were low in turnovers. They held teams good to low. They held good teams to low point totals. I It just felt like they couldn't catch a break in some of those close matchups. And now it's like well, they come into they're... 2023 and they go, we're not having close matchups. We're just beating you by a margin. And it feels like they might do that against the Flyers. They've, they've got some <laughs> motivation here after losing the season series, getting swept in the season series last year. And it, and it feels yeah. like they have the firepower advantage for the first time maybe ever against the Flyers, right? Like, yeah. this is, this I, is kind I of think one so. of the first true times where you look at this Atlanta team, they're going to be minus Max Thorne, who was great in his 2023 de- debut last weekend. But mm-hmm. other than that, this is full strength hustle and they look damn good, man. I, I yeah. you know, as much as I look forward to this first of four meetings that they have with Carolina in 2023, it just makes me want that, that later in the season empire matchup that the hustle have coming up. Right. Like, oh yeah. That's going to be That'll big. Be so fun. Big, man. Uh, yeah, well, but I do think we have to, you know, tentatively pump the brakes on Atlanta because they have been a, a bit of a roller coaster of a team the past couple seasons. And I think that has been the knock against them is like we see them at their ceiling and they look incredible. They look like they can take on literally any team in the league, including New York. But then we see other games like the end of that game against Austin and the day before that against Dallas last year. So, you know, TBD what they look like throughout the season, but I think it's a great sign that they started as strong as they did against Indy. Well, and to that same point, but kind of for the other franchise involved in this Friday night matchup, Carolina, this is starting to look very similar to the start of the 20. I know. Like, do we, do we pick Carolina to win it all at this point just because of their first look, weird game against DC? They, there are they're starting to become some odd parallels, right? Like they started 2021 0-2 by losing to guess who? The DC Breeze and the Atlanta Hustle. Who are their first two opponents in 2023? Those same two teams. Throughout the first half of that 2021 season, it was a lot of open lines for the Flyers. There was a lot of Terrence Mitchell on defense. They were trying to figure out how exactly they wanted to use Anders Jungst, who eventually became the AUDL Rookie of the Year that season. But in those first couple games, I remember seeing they were having a little bit of rhythm problems, using him in that connecting role between the backfield set of Yannick and Gucho Hannes and the downfield receivers of Mitchell and Fisher and Fairfax, etc., But then, Mm -hmm. you know, through attrition, through a bunch of tough matchups in the first half of the season, the second half of the season, we all know the Flyers go on to win the title. And it's just, there's still so much talent here. They still tied DC at 15s in the fourth quarter, despite as rocky of a play as they had for the Flyers. You know, they, they committed 20 turnovers in week one this season. They did that once all of last year. Uh... But they're still the damn Flyers, man. They're still this team. Yeah. They still have talent. There's still so much that you look on this roster and you go, yep, that works. And, and you could see that. Even, even though it was a little bit more squint to identify it last week than we're used to. A lot with the more Flyers, squint. But, yeah. Right. Like, you know, last year they took so much of the injuries and, and adjustments to their roster in stride that I mm-hmm. think maybe we set our expectations up for them to always have that level of adaptability against any opponent. And I think you just saw in week one, DC Breeze are a damn good team, and Carolina just didn't quite have the juice in that, but they're going to still you know, work through all of these rotations and figure out what are best for them, and they have so much talent, I, I don't want to doubt them. And and it does feel like, you know, now I'm starting to talk myself into it, one of those kind of, rope dope game for Carolina where yeah Atlanta has all the advantages that is kind of one of the times where Carolina starts to win in this regional rivalry that goes back yeah. well beyond even AUDL play right like Carolina Atlanta that's fair that's, that's been brewing for a long time so I, I'm looking forward to it who, who do you have in this matchup I I'll, I'll just say it. I have Atlanta if I had to set a line it would be like two and a half I'd be Atlanta by two and a half. Yeah. 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 I, I would agree with you. I have Atlanta winning. 
I too well they for this to be any kind of true blowout. I mean, I, yeah. I would have to look at the last time there was more than like a four goal margin between these two teams, but I imagine it's before twenty twenty one. Right. I mean, last year, last year, I know two of their games were decided by two goals. Maybe the other one was like a right. three or four goal win for Carolina. I would take Atlanta by three or more this Friday. I mean, it's not like. It's not a super confident pick to win by that margin because I agree with you. These teams are just always kind of destined to play each other close. But yeah, I'm just, I, you look at the Carolina roster and it's kind of like, yeah, last year they were able to take all those injuries and stuff in stride because they did have the personnel to replace them. But at a certain point, like they just keep, they keep peeling back these layers. Like no Henry Fisher this year. That feels like a huge presence gone. Kucho Hannes, obviously we saw the backfield kind of in, a weird state against DC. So I, I just think they're kind of at the point where they're falling apart a little bit. Dude, Johannes, man, like it, it, his absence, I think is so accentuated by the style of play. He has been such a rock yeah. and it's always one of those things where you and I have wondered, you know, he's one of those players who clearly supersedes his statistical output. And I think last yeah. week was a real big Testament as to what he provides for that team. Uh, I just wanted to say one Definitely. more thing. Uh, New Atlanta head coach, two bench and Jaja. I mean, talk about hey, a twenty twenty three great debut. New that was yeah. I don't know that I've seen a, a coach come in and tune up a team like that so quickly with with relatively the same existing pieces that were already there. I mean, it just everyone was just kind of in concert. It looks like they're all coded the same way. They they move kind of similarly. Bobby Lay is playing like peak Bobby Lay on the old cannons teams and he was just winging it uh you know he was good for them last year it felt like sometimes his deep looks were sort of outside of the rest of the system and I think in general Mm -hmm. the Atlanta throwing opportunities and especially their huck happy lifestyle really kind of made it in an atomization of parts where man that week one team they were just together (laughs) they 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 were just running together like yeah, just I mean, they look that. new and improved, but like you said, it is kind of the same personnel, which is cool to see coming into the season. I'm happy for them. Uh, a team without the same personnel whatsoever as last year. <laughs> we get to big next turnover. This, this big, big, big Saturday night West Division AUDL game of the week. Colorado Summit, last year's divisional champs representing the West at AUDL Championship Weekend will be taking on the new look Los Angeles Aviators. It'll be the debut of Pavel Giannis, the league's leader, all-time leader in assists and completions. He will be joined by a number of other off-season signings, including franchise leader in goals and blocks, Sean McDougal, Jason Valley, also coming over from Chicago alongside Pavel Giannis, Daniel Brunker, who played for Colorado last year and was so good as a need fit piece in both offensive and defensive roles. He will be debuting for the aviators this weekend. There's just a lot going on here in this matchup, right? I mean, we've talked before about Giannis's extensive connections to the summit and the Colorado ultimate scene. He went to their first ever tryout in 2022, just to kind of participate in it. He's, (laughs) you know, talked extensively this off season about, One of the things he's most excited about about playing in the West Division is getting this at least two times a year matchup against Colorado, getting a chance to just set a new, I think, uh, a bullseye on his target board. You know, for so many years, it was his opponents in the Central Division, particularly, I think, for a number of years, the Madison Radicals. Feels like Colorado has sort of filled that... uh, um, that antagonist role that I think Giannis uses so well to fuel his great play. Um, This is a battle between the number three and the number eight team in my power rankings. I bumped down LA a little bit this week, just because of how strong Salt Lake and Atlanta played. Uh, I I didn't think necessarily that LA slipped in terms of what I expect from them this year. Uh, I, I just, I, I think that there's a lot of interesting teams and, and I'm waiting to see what this aviators team has to bring in their debut premiere to the season. They will be without uh, team leader, Michael Keoy, as well as their throwing leader from last season and Brandon Van Dusen. Both will be out for this matchup. Meanwhile, Colorado basically brings in 
a relatively full strength roster. They will be without Alex mm-hmm. Atkins, who uh, is out with an injury, as well as Calvin Stoughton, who will not be making his rookie debut quite yet. Danny Landisman is still in college. So they're missing a couple of their top end playmakers. But <laughs> so we've talked extensively with the Summit team. You've still got Jonathan Nelica, Dave Frude, Quinn Finer, Cody Spicer, the rating defensive player of the year, a thousand playmaking defenders. The Summit team stands to be the prohibitive favorites to win the division again this year. Can LA do this? Can LA take advantage of the Summit maybe being a little bit tired-legged, having played San Diego on Friday night? Is there enough of Pavel magic? Is there enough juice to all these changes and sort of the reinvigoration of the LA franchise? What's going on here for you? It's, It's going to require... LA's offense to click immediately quickly and early like I'm I'm worried about it because they're not at full full strength without Van Dusen who was kind of like their focal point last year and has been kind of coming up as a super talented player the past few years Michael Keoy's absence is going to be big too so yeah a lot of it is going to hinge on Pavel and if they structure things like we think they will with Pavel as center handler as that quarterback I, I do think that gives them their best chance of winning, just if you can run the offense through him and just allow him to to distribute and facilitate every single possession. But I worry about the ability to like build up the instant chemistry needed to keep pace with a Colorado team as talented as this one. I think the hope for LA is that Colorado, this being the second game of a back-to-back, without those few key pieces on offense, you mentioned Landisman, Atkins, Calvin Stoughton, like, they still have Nethercut, obviously, and they still have Frood, Matt Jackson, Quinn Finer. But, like, those three guys right there, you know, normally they'd have, like, five or six hybrids around Nethercut. Now they're down to three hybrids around Nethercut. So I do think if those guys are, like, needed to work a lot in that San Diego game, I could see the Colorado offense potentially getting tired, potentially trying to lean on Nethercut's arm to like get them quicker possessions and use that deep speed that they have, um, which could lead to more turnovers. And if Pavel can bring in kind of a new, uh, a low turnover mentality to the LA team, again, easier said than done against this Colorado defense. But to me, that's like LA's best chance of winning this game. I think last year we spent a lot of time you know, aptly so talking about this big play, another cut fueled summit offense. When I look at this roster this year, the thing that takes my breath away about the summit team is its defensive playmaking. I mean, it starts at the top with the reigning defensive player of the year in Spicer. And it just goes on from there. Alex Tatum and Matthew Agee were just androids in their rookie season. I mean, if there's a disc in the air, they're going to it. In terms of A to B playmaking ability, there are few better than those two. Let's continue to go on. They had Kai Marshall, who maybe had the best defensive championship weekend ever for Dallas in 2019. He had a five-block performance in the semifinal. It's hard to think of a more impactful defensive uh, performance from a single individual in a higher caliber game than he had there. He's six foot five. So they add him to Spicer and it's just the Bash brothers, man. Like it's such a front to overcome those two bigs. They're both going to be active this weekend. They're going to provide a canopy. And then again, beneath that canopy are our cheetahs. It's, it's AG (laughs) and Tatum. They added in Noah Kuhlman from Seattle who has rockets on his shoes. Uh, Nicholas Schnuzka will detonate passes in the air he is an anti-air defense system unto his own he can play help defense a lot of times because of how intelligent all the other defenders are around him they've added in a couple more young athletic colorado playmakers uh, rookies this year in 2023 i hear what you're saying about pavel's presence being able to stabilize and solidify some of the things that aviators are working on last year as they were developing as a team. I just worry about those things coming together against what is essentially a demolition squad of the best (laughs) defensive playmakers out there right now. I mean, I think New York has a better defense. I think that they've played together longer. They have a better philosophy. And I think the results Mm -hmm. kind of speak for themselves there. But in terms of just hey, do you want to play this defense tonight? 
I don't know that there's another team out there besides Colorado that would be as intimidating. Like they just yeah, they're out they're, there. They're gonna go out sure. there and bruise you. Like they they're gonna be no fun. It's gonna be no fun at times to play the Summit defense this year. Do you think do you think Spicer's going to take the Powell matchup? He did at Championship weekend when Colorado did, and Chicago played. And and Chicago kind of smartly ran Pavel on a rail and ran a lot of the offense away from him and sort of they removed did. Yeah. Ice from a lot of his playmaking. He came up with two blocks, but they were on swilly reset throws and at times where the union had a stable lead there was one and there was one deep shot i don't remember oh, who, maybe it was ross that yeah, took te- a deep yeah, shot to pavel tested, or something yeah they wanted to test spicer <laughs> they tested a, a pavel versus spicer in the deep space did not work out yeah um, yeah no um i thought that was wonderful strategizing by chicago i think that that's still a good matchup for the summit i just would like to see how LA uses them. I don't think LA can not use Pavel in the same way that Chicago was able to in that semifinal. I agree. That's why, that's why the Van Dusen absence is like huge. Cause they could maybe get away with not using Pavel. Have, yeah. How great would that be? Just the Pavel LA debut. He's just a total decoy, just like hanging out with Spicer, just chatting all game while Van Dusen does his thing on the field. But no, we'll have to wait. At least a couple more weeks till see that. So we've heard some rumors that Jason Valley might be switching over, playing some offensive points in this matchup. I wonder I don't if know how I feel Brunker's about that. Get, I wonder if Daniel Brunker is going to get some time. Yeah, I, I, I think with how high octane and the specific kinds of players that the Colorado offense can throw at you, I think you need Valley back there. You right? need Valley on defense. You got to have him taking like there? one of those top matchups on Colorado's I mean, it, offense. It just feels like. like he's meant for a fruit or a finer, right? Like what, yeah. what else are you doing there? If not right. putting a Valley or a Brunker on one of those two, just him on just him on finer. Play. I would like a lot because finer finer might be a little bit more involved in the backfield too, without those kind of more stable and complementary pieces to another cut around. So, yeah, I mean, I like Valley's versatility on defense a lot more than I like his offensive ability, but yeah, they're a little shorthanded. So we'll see what happens. We've, we've talked about this matchup a couple of times leading into the season. I think we still both relatively feel the same way, which is that we're excited about LA, but this just feels too soon against the Colorado team that appears a notch above the rest in the West. And we do expect, I think, Pavel to introduce a, a new kind of disc discipline to LA, sort of bringing in a little Hopefully. bit more... Central Division ball, I think it was interesting. Cameron Brock mentioned in your player chatter article there wasn't a West Division in week a West Division game in week one that didn't feature 35 combined turnovers. That kind of stat I think would cause a Pavel Giannis type handler to break out into hives. And so I expect right. that kind of West ball that we've maybe become accustomed to to not play in as much to this matchup. And and Colorado, to their credit. One of the ways in which they so much separated themselves from the rest of the division last season in the back half was yeah. by just continually decreasing their turnovers, continually decreasing their mistakes and allowing their opponents to beat them and just being overloaded with ample opportunity that they can obviously convert on. Um, I, I yeah. wonder if for LA, the, the truest strategy is to just try to limit turnover I know I know it becomes so simple and you know at the same time I'm saying that it's like you can't you can't play scared against Colorado because then they can settle in and start yeah. anticipating things like you need to it's keep just some amount of field open and and accessible and keep some range in your game but again right it but it's like, like being it's being disciplined it's like you can be you can be playing not scared but also just being disciplined like just be smart about taking those deep shots really just like be comfortable taking like 10 to 15 yard gainers looking off those deep throws just knowing that you have to value each possession that much more because also this Colorado defense on the counter attack not something you want to deal with either so no no Tatum again is just really good with the disc off a of turnover yeah well and Kai, Kai Marshall play. played some offense in Dallas too like no one wants to deal with a 6-5 guy running at you full speed so. I think he scored 40 odd goals in his rookie season in 2016. Did Dallas. he really? Yeah, That's a fun he's, he's stat. A monster, man. He's just a <laughs> big dude. And he's, 
it's going into a lineup with another group of big dudes. Uh, yeah, Colorado looks like a strong team this year, but I forgot oh. real quick. Connor Olson is also debuting yeah. for Colorado, right? He's yeah, and he. I don't know where he's going to slot in. Yeah. He might. He, I could see him on either offense or defense. I don't know if he, he's going to have like uh, enough seamless chemistry to fit onto the O line right away. So they might try him on defense, but. Either way, I mean, he's just like a playmaker, right? So I, I think he's going to help them too. I don't know that we've seen him at full strength since he had that fantastic 2019 championship weekend with Dallas. I feel like he's been struggling coming back from injuries, cycling in and out of playing time, but you're absolutely correct. If he finds a home somewhere on this summit roster, be it offense or defense, like that kid can play. Like he just goes out there and makes plays. Yeah. He's got great throws. He had the longest throw of the uh, 2019 season it was actually i think in the semifinal game right. that huge io rip against san diego oh uh, just his io flicks back. man those are those are very aesthetic to watch you, and you were just saying not too long ago that this colorado team might be lacking a couple hybrids and it's like oh <laughs> i forgot well uh, i don't know i like oh, i know right i i just with how with how well oiled of a machine their offense was last year i I don't like. I don't know if Olsen fits right in as a newcomer to this team, but I I wouldn't put it past them and or him to like be a seamless fit in this offense as well. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of guys and he's played with before also, and Matt Jackson and Jay Fruit. So like, you know, same guys. There's a little bit of a Dallas raft forming in this Summit roster, right? There is se- several Fruit, former Jackson, Dallas players. Ty Marshall. Am I forgetting anyone? I feel like there might be one more. It's nice. Some championship yeah. experience. Uh, all right. That will do it for our two big previews. We're going to move on now to a little bit more of a potpourri, just kind of getting some quick reactions. We're each going to talk about how each team can win in four upcoming matchups for this weekend. We'll be starting in chronological order, starting with a Friday night East Division matchup as the Toronto Rush gets set for their 2023 debut on the road against the defending champion, New York Empire, who just demolished Philly last week, <laughs> 17 to 8 in the rain. I like Toronto a lot in this game. I think it's I, I I've liked all the things that they've done in the offseason. This is not a great way to start the year. <laughs> is to go against an Empire team with a one game rep, getting it getting a good win, getting some blood on their teeth, and now they get to play a Toronto team who they just rocked in both matchups last year. I mean <laughs> like I wrote about in my power rankings, Toronto had to watch a little bit of that Philly game and go, oh yeah, that was just like when we got <laughs> Dallas 25 to eight against New York last year. I mean, the yeah. Empire can just roll up and wallop teams. And, and again, it's that D-line. Like, it's that D-line. That D-line. It's, they just, they it's can both, explode both games. D-lines. Right, it's, it's, it's both it's D-lines. Bad. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Matt Stevens, I was talking with him, player and GM for New York, and I think he said that the D2 line that they run, which is kind of like what they run without their stars of Marcus Brownlee, Ben Katz, uh, John Randolph, it's kind of the yeah. other guys. They were like eight of nine on defensive break opportunities, I think, yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dros just turned into swamp creatures in the rain. The Dros destroyed in that game. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah it's yeah. muck. If you want a rock <laughs> fight, you go get the Dros, man. Oh, like, yeah. They were ready for it. Born for just black ball. Like, uh, <laughs> they come from that faceless mob mentality that started the whole yeah. Empire franchise. So, uh Number one and number two all time in blocks showing out last weekend. Uh, But we should each get into our takes as to why we think each team could win in this matchup. I know I just spent a bunch of time saying how the Toronto were disadvantaged, (laughs) but I do think if they can somehow find a way to make this New York offense or defense, excuse me, just unsettle a little bit so that they can turn it into a higher scoring affair like the rush like to do get Ty Barbieri out into space get James Lewis out into space get Oscar Stonehouse playmaking get Luke Camire in that pivot role that he's so good at get Jeff Bevan blasting Hucks out into space I do think that the rush can turn this into a shootout and have a puncher's chance in that environment on the flip side if I'm the empire this this game plan that they've been rolling out effectively since the start of championship weekend where the offense just plays some of the most boring possessions and the defense just kind of feeds an opposing uh, 
team's offense into a wood chipper feet first. Like, that works out really well for them right now. Just kind of taking the legs from their opponent slowly, and then the second half just opening it up. And I, I think for New York, it's just playing the exact same way they did last week, where they just they know they're better. We're going to execute. We're going to love all of the small details. That was something that really stood out to me about the Empire last week. Mm-hmm. They were rallying around each other for the smallest execution uh, uh place just just getting a hand block running to the right spot cutting off a throw uh communicating correctly like they were just in it and i think that is something that is something that uh opponents need to take mindful of is that this new york team isn't just about making highlights anymore in fact they're kind of going the opposite way they're just paying attention to the process and the devils and the details and and like that is sort of the next level of dynasty right like they just love all of that intricate stuff. Um, and so anyways, that's that's a rambling tangent, but I think New York just needs to keep doing that, right? Like they just need to be who they are um, at this point. Yep. There's, there's nothing special to say about New York that they haven't already shown on the field. Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add, right? Toronto, it, my mind goes back to that game they played against DC, which granted was in Toronto. They seem, they seem to hit another level at home for whatever reason last year. Maybe they'll do the same thing this year. It doesn't bode well for their week two road trip this weekend. But yeah, I mean, that game against DC, it was just like offenses trading scores. Like somehow Toronto had it in them to play like whatever, a, a 10 turnover game uh and yeah that's going to be their only shot if they're just clicking offensively from the start going blow for blow with new york and yeah i i don't see it happening personally but that would be the route to winning this game and for new york right i I think on d-line they have to like match the the boringness of the counterattack with their o-lines boringness like no need to like take crazy deep shots right off of turnovers like you don't really have to exaggerate the fast break nature of defense but take what's there, and, and like I just think they they have enough talent on this team on both sides of the disc to kind of just play their game and, and do what they need to to get this win. Yeah, yeah. All of our char talk too. They get another just gigantic <laughs> defender right. to throw yeah. out there. They didn't the... need another one, but they got one no. anyway. So. No, he looks like another Babbitt right now. Like he put on some bulk this off season. That boy is hard to move like an oak tree like that <laughs> unfair man they already got benya antoine davis marquez brownlee they've got size yeah they, they don't have bad, but they, they... anyways anyways yeah let's move on oh, to the other God. friday night matchup the actual first game in colorado socal road trip at san diego san diego of course taking the only regular season game from the summit last season but Growlers did lose a substantial amount of players in the offseason, so we are anticipating the Summit to come out with a show of force in their 2023 debut. I think in this game, they just need to, kind of as I was talking about in the Game of the Week matchup, play up defensively. I don't think that yep. San Diego, for as good as Paul Alley is, for as good as Travis Dunn is, for as solid as Kyle Rubin has been the past two seasons for this team, they just... I don't know that they have enough to overcome the kinds of defensive coverage players that the summit can throw at you. I just, I, I, I think that Kai Marshall and Cody Spicer are going to be answers for Paul Alley and Travis Dunn about as good as you can have. And then from there, it feels like Colorado is just going to have a lot of advantages in one-on-one matchups. So I think right. the summit just need to go out there and run on defense. I, I don't think too much about their offense. I, I think they just need to go out there and get takeaways and just kind of swell up their defensive break opportunities because I, I, I expect a little bit of a blowout in this. And then for San Diego, I think they need a similar game plan as last year. I think they need to make it really hard for the summit to score breaks. And I think they're just going to need gigantic games from Lally and Dunn. Similar to last year. What Dunn have? Like 800 total yards. He had eight assists or something. Lally had upwards of 70 completions. Yeah, yeah. They were just workhorses. And Growlers are going to need it again. Yeah, I I think with Colorado, I'm, I'm with you. Like their defense, I think, should define this road trip for them, right? Like if they play the way defensively that, that we think they can against both San Diego and LA, they shouldn't really have any problems. I do think... Uh, that San Diego might have an opening if 
yeah, I mean, similar with the, I don't know if I talked about this with LA, but with San Diego's D line, if, if Nethercut is launching the disc maybe a bit too much and turning the disc over a little bit too freely, if their D line can be efficient with their break opportunities, then I do think, you know, it's also like there's an asterisk. asterisk yes, Travis Dunn and Paul Lally still have to have a, a good enough games on offense to like keep their offense, you know, within striking distance to Colorado. But I, I do look at the San Diego D line and, and I'm kind of like, if they can kind of have a new, a new somewhat of a faceless mob identity of their own and really key in on converting break opportunities, especially if they're able to get, I don't know, like something like 10 break opportunities potentially. I think that could keep them in this game and potentially be enough to, to pull out the win. But I would agree with you in that I would heavily favor Colorado in this game, probably by like, I don't know, five and a half, six and a half goals. It feels like a lot, but Is that too much. I don't, Five and I don't half. know. Colorado was so good. And it that was their first year together last year. Like, I think we expected them. We, we pushed Well, and they, they really yeah. they really yeah. went like this all season. Until championship weekend, they, they kind of dropped off. So now they're back they're to off. here. So now it's got to be the, the gradual climb again. But, yeah, I don't know. Five and a half goals seems like the right line. Yeah. Hit a Sam Kaminsky side ceiling last year in the semifinals. Referencing, of course, his, his big sky <laughs> with two defenders in the semifinal yeah. against Colorado. But let's continue to move on. We'll move on to a Saturday matchup. We're shifting to the Central Division. Minnesota Winchell making their debut at Indianapolis. Alley Cats last weekend falling on the road to Atlanta. So needing this home win in order to avoid slipping to 0-2. And on the flip side for Minnesota... They've been known to really rack up points at this Grand Park indoor facility in Indy. Uh, Josh Klain and Quinn Snyder have had fantastic games here in the past. Abe Coffin shifting mm-hmm. to offense certainly looks like a fantasy player's delight. Just feels like easy 500 yards for him if he's getting any kind of touches on offense. Uh, for mm-hmm. Minnesota, for me, it's, it's again, it, it's, I think working through Abe. That's how you win this game. Uh, Abe Coffin has been shown to be over the last several seasons, one of the most proficient offensive players with or without the disc. That isn't a secret. And I think that the wind chill at times last season, because they had so much talent, they got a little bit cute with their rotations. They, they taste a little bit of this lineup and then they go back to this sort of ball, you know, they, they play the a Roy Jurek sort of small ball weave rotations. And then they try to open things up and engage a little bit more of their lawn looks with maybe a, a clean shot to Snyder. It felt like there were a little too many identities to the Winchell offense, and I just feel like Coffin is going to simplify so much of that. You just kind of put the disc in his hands and let him go to work. Uh, for Indy, I think it's sort of learning all the mistakes that they made last week, right, which was way too many uh not well thought out huck looks, not taking the right kinds of shots. Indianapolis was second in the league last year in huck completion rate. That did not look like the same team. It did not look like it. Just letting rip into whatever coverage was down there. Uh, I think Minnesota similarly has some bigger athletes in Jimmy Kittleson and Colin Berry that can really make those huck looks problematic, even in indoors where throwers can control so much of the shape and velocity on their throws. The windshield have good playmakers on the disc. Dylan DeClerc, too, <laughs> has been one of the best takeaway artists over the past several seasons. So I think Indy needs to be more discerning with their looks, and I think they need to get back more towards what works for them, which is swinging the disc sideline to sideline and trusting that when they get close to the goal, they've got the greatest finisher of all time in Cameron Brock, and they just need to, similar to Minnesota, simplify things. They know what works in their offense. They know where to take shots from. They know how to get Keegan North and Levi Jacobs into their hot spots. Use those things, you know, mm-hmm. uh, abuse them at times. I, I don't think, you know, for as well as these two teams know each other, you don't got to be cute with it. There isn't going to be some magic trick you can pull to fool these opponents. You play three to four times a year, every year for the past half decade, you know? So I think, both teams just need to come out and and kind of perform to their strengths in whichever team can sort of, I, I know it's sort of trite, disable the other team's strength sooner, I think is going to mm-hmm. have a, a clear advantage here. Because it, in this grand park environment, it's all about 
getting to that kind of top end offensive rhythm and then just clicking there, right? Like just, right. just starting to hit kind of like the combo meter and getting to like 26 points scored or something. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, it's going to be an offense driven game. I would set the over under for point total at like 48, probably like a 25, 25 game ish. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe fit like, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the 50 last weekend, but the, I think Short their last game though 25 in this park like <laughs> <laughs> was it was it 2019 or 20 what was the claim to Quinn Snyder just like shootout fest yeah was it 2019? 2019 and that yeah. game I feel like was I don't know like 26 to something was that like was like game. 50 park points it was like 28 so. yeah so right I mean similarly I'm I'm laser focused on the backfields of Minnesota just like how it looks without Andrew Roy Josh Klain Abe Coffin presumably are going to be the drivers of this offense now does clean kind of step back into that main quarterback shooter role or is it just like a new look offense more structured around Abe Coffin like you were saying um so I'm curious to see like how those guys fit in but I, I do think clean is going to be launching the disc and, and Abe is capable of those throws too so Minnesota deep game especially hucking to Quinn Snyder on the receiving end is going to be key and then with Indianapolis right it's those should I try naming all of them? It's it's the Cameron Brock, Levi Jacobs, Carpenter, Rick Gross, Keegan North. Who would I forget? It's that core of vets that that are there every single year. It's like they have to get in rhythm and stay in rhythm. And they're fully capable of doing that. This is like it's their home turf. They love this indoor environment. We've seen Keegan North go off in these games before. But, you know, I, I think they can also get a little bit uh, I don't know, their their ability to close out games late, I think, has been a question mark for them the past couple of seasons. Like last year, they had one goal losses to both Madison and Chicago in Indy, where they were like playing super well all game, but then kind of fell apart. Obviously, they, they started to change the narrative in that second meeting with Madison at Bree Stevens Field. But I don't know, there's still something about this Indy team where I'm like, can they solidify an identity as a team that can really close out opponents, especially at home? So I think that could be key as well, because I, I do expect this to be a super close game really throughout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's continue to move on. We've got one final matchup just to kind of tussle with. Sunday's only game, Philadelphia Phoenix at the DC Breeze. Breeze, of course, sweeping the season series last year 3-0, but the first two games came down to the final possession. The Breeze were contending with the Phoenix in the first half of their first round playoff game in 2022, but they put them away pretty handily in the second half. Breeze, of course, looking so good in their 2023 season debut last weekend. They will now have their home opener on Sunday. Philly, meanwhile, is looking to pick up the pieces after getting obliterated by Empire on the road. They now face the second toughest team ostensibly in the league in their second game of the season. No one has started this year with a harder schedule than the Phoenix, but this is kind of what they asked for, right? They wanted the big test at the top of this division and boy, are they getting it? They're getting I, think, it. I think for Philly to win, they have to diversify their attack. They looked frustrated and without resolve in the rain last weekend when they couldn't engage those deep looks that they liked so well. They didn't want to swing the disc at times, quite frankly. They just, it wasn't what they wanted to do. And I think they need to be a little bit more patient in getting into the looks that they like. I think they mm -hmm. almost came out like they wanted to play an NBA jam style of ultimate last weekend, where they just expect kind of, you know, one to two connections to really work out for them that they use a lot of times, you know, the Mott to Pollard, the Pollard to Martin, the, the Alex Thorne to any number of people downfield. But I think it really takes more of a concert between their pieces. And so I think if Philly can get back to a more distributive and spread attack and not rely on the long ball, they will have a chance once again against the Breeze, who they've shown to play up against the past season or so. For the Breeze, I think you got to kind of rope-a-dope Philly again. I think that they did that in the playoff game. I think they said, okay, look, you can just huck it over the top. Look at all these hucks in the first half. <laughs> You're wow, look at you, big huck boy, like just completing all these deep throws. And then in the second half, they kind of just shut off the hose. They just stopped letting 
Philly attack over the top. They started dropping Musa Ja back more. They started just being a little bit more aware. And you could see, once again, Philly didn't have a whole bunch of secondary options to go to once those deep pucks weren't connecting anymore. I think the Mm -hmm. same thing applies to this game for the Breeze. I think they kind of say, hey, look at all that deep space behind us. You could go for that all the time. And then I think similar to last week, they just get really efficient with their defensive break opportunities. I think we saw kind of what we were talking about in our recap episode a couple of days ago, that Rowan was very solid in his first game as sort of the new defensive captain of the Breeze. But we expect him to continue to fill out that role more and more. And I feel like this is going to be one of those games where Mm -hmm. you might see kind of like what Halsmeyer did last weekend, where he almost got 300 yards of total offense. I could see Rowan having a game like that. I don't think he'll have six blocks like Halsmeyer. That's it's not really what Rowan does, and he doesn't play deep, deep. Uh, but I, I could see him kind of having a very robust stat performance on the defensive mm-hmm. rotation. Yeah, no, I, I think I'd point to similar things. I think with Philly, it's kind of like a, I'm going to take bits and pieces of what you said and, and take it my own way. I think they can start with like the mindset that we're gonna start the way we did in that playoff game where yeah it's it's doing what they do best obviously when they can't do what they do best they struggle like with new york the weather took away really any any opportunity to have those deep looks and establish any sort of rhythm obviously new york's bigs did not help with that either but if they can establish something quickly Ride it until it doesn't work anymore. And then it's like, you have to be able to make those in-game adjustments to like, if you, if you start missing a couple hucks in the middle of the game or in the third quarter, just like get away from it. Like, I just don't see them winning over the course of an entire game with guys like AJ Merriman and Musa Jaw like working over the top on that defense. I just think it's kind of destined to fail at some point, which is what happened in the playoff game. The problem was they never really adjusted around that. So then they just lost a lot of ground to DC. So it's like, be ready mentally as an offense to just shift your game plan, shift your priorities in the middle of the game. And I, I think they could be okay in at least keeping the game close. Um, DC, 100%, I agree on the defensive break opportunities. Because like Philly is not going to play perfect. They are not one of these seven turnover teams that we've seen in the league, yeah. they're typically going to turn the disc over at least 15 times. So even if DC's offense still has to like work out some early season kinks, you know, it wasn't perfect against Carolina, but yeah, it was their D line that just has enough enough rhythm and chemistry and consistency that they can punch in those break opportunities to open the game up. So you know, I fully expect DC to to win this game by at least a few goals, but it's going to be like uh, it's going to be on the D line to to open up the game especially late i i i don't expect some of these games to be as wide i think of margins as you're saying i think a lot of these teams are too familiar a few for goals happen, but i don't know three I, I, goal win know, for dc obviously i can be wrong i i've been wrong many 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 what's times. your well what's your line for this game i'd say it's like dc <sighs> by i don't know two and a half See, I'm going to say a number, and then it's going to be completely upended <laughs> by whatever the result is. Uh, I'll say DC two and a half again. I, I, that's always kind of my mark. And you would, for. and you would take, you would take Philly to, to. I forget the language. Cover what? What yeah. team covers the spread? No. no, covering the spread, I think, would be DC winning by three or more. You, you take Philly and the points. Philly and the points. This was a. It was a Donardis, uh Twitter DM saying, you're last get a year. We'll pull it up. He's going to come. <laughs> careening this, in that's it though line. that's it though no no, no. it's yeah, no, you got philly it. you got in the it. points or dc covers yeah i I'm got saying dc, DC to cover covers. that i got dc okay. to cover that so the more i think about it just watching how dc looked last year last week and i i i worry that philly is gonna play desperate and dc is like one of the last teams you can play desperate against right like you you just have to yeah. hold the line and be disciplined because the breeze are outside of New York, probably the most disciplined team in the league this year. Um, But that'll do it for the week two preview pod. We're wrapping up here. Games get started tomorrow night on watch.audl.tv. You can tune in there. There's a ton of preview content coming out right now on the audl.com website. Please tune in there as well. We thank you as always for tuning in here. We'll see you soon. Bye.